I'm Corazon Favros, uh, currently the co-president of the International Peace Bureau. And I'm also with the Peace and Security Cluster of the Asia-Europe People's Forum. And that seems to be the reason why I cannot accept this uh, responsibility at this point to moderate. I'm going to, to, to try to moderate our discussion. And um, I'd like to also introduce um, one of our rising uh, young leaders uh, at IPB, uh, Rafi, can you introduce yourself? Hello, uh, my name is Rafi. Uh, I'm glad to moderate this event. Um, I'm a Gina K. Watson Fellow, and that has enabled me to uh, intern at the International Peace Bureau for uh, the next month and a half. Uh, I'm currently working on common security, so uh, nice to meet everyone. Thank you, Rafi. And uh, on behalf of the uh, Asia Europe People's Forum and the International Peace Bureau, we are honored to welcome you all to today's roundtable discussion on global NATO, its implications and resistance. This is an event that has been organized um, at short notice, but given the urgency of creating a platform for knowledge and analysis sharing on an issue that has far reaching implications to peace and security, uh, we would like to thank our panelists uh, uh, for giving us their precious time, um, despite the uh, short notice that we have given them. And, uh, and for some of you, some of our panelists, uh, it is early morning where you are. <laughs> uh, it is also a rare opportunity, I would say, to have the four of them together in one occasion. And so that uh, that is, uh, for me, um, uh, something that's uh, really uh, also uh, 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 important to thank them for that. And a little bit about the Asia Europe People's Forum. It, uh, uh, I would say uh, it has been for, for a while, uh, the an inter-regional network of progressive civil society organizations from across Asia and Europe. So it is actually a an important dialogue platform mm -hmm. uh, for for many years now, since uh, 1996. Um, it has consistently been a network linking Asia and European NGOs and social movements including parliamentarians and uh, political parties uh, in Europe and Asia. On the other hand, the International Peace Bureau um, for many years, for many decades, or even more than a century, I think, is dedicated to the vision of world without war. And our current main program centers on disarmament for sustainable development and uh, a very strong uh, uh, focus or, uh, on, um, on reducing uh, funding uh, for the military sector and uh, the significant amounts of money uh, uh, should, uh, to our uh, mind, uh, uh, be uh, released for social projects uh, and domestically or abroad, which could lead to the fulfillment of real human needs and, and uh, genuine security, uh, and of also for the protection of the environment. We support a broad range of disarmament campaigns uh, in, in many regions of the world, and uh, supply data on economic dimensions of weapons and conflicts, including, of course, uh, 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 one of the central uh, advocacies of IPB uh, for a couple of years now, which is common security. Um, uh, going to uh, particularly on, uh, on, on the topic today, uh, we're doing this because uh, recently NATO, or what we call the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, uh, uh, marked its 75th 
you imagine 75 years, no? Anniversary recently has declared and has declared itself as a even more belligerent alliance ready to enforce its order globally. And that's why we titled our, our uh, roundtable discussion today as Global NATO, because that is what it has become. Um, okay, um, a couple of our uh, speakers uh, were just uh, just came from a uh, civil society summit, uh, the No to NATO, Yes to Peace uh, conference that was held in uh, Washington, D.C., at, well attended by movements and uh, organizations that uh, uh, continues to kind of uh, uh, try to resist the ongoing wars of domination and uh, and um, and uh, uh, providing uh, alternatives of platforms for a discussion and looking at possible uh, build up of movements uh, to continue to resist this uh, highly uh, uh, military, high militarization in many parts of the world. So uh, it will be a, a very straightforward uh, flow of our program. And I would also like to say that um, this, um, <clears throat> this round table is being live streamed uh, in, um, I don't know what, social media accounts of, uh, International Peace Bureau, and will later be available on YouTube channels and other uh, uh, social media streams, both uh, of AEPF and the NIPB. So as I said, it is going to be a very straightforward uh, program, uh, giving our panelists uh, eight minutes or so. Uh, <laughs> to give their introductory remarks. Uh, and we have requested them to have particular focus just so there is no overlap. And then uh, we will move on to, uh, to, to a Q and A uh, and discussion. So, so we're hoping you could uh, eventually uh, uh, give your questions and uh, uh, and we'll ask our panelists uh, to answer them, whoever would properly answer it. So let me introduce our speakers very briefly at this point. And um, uh, I, I think IPB uh, staff at Berlin will, will provide the longer uh, uh, bio of each one of them. Uh, and we're saving time, so very briefly, I'd like to introduce Joseph Gerson, who is president of the Campaign for Peace, Disarmament, and Common Security. Okay. And then uh, Rainer Brown, um, who is a, a lead convener of the international No to NATO, No to War Network in Germany. He was also a former co-president and executive director of IPB for many years. And of course, uh, Rainer remains to be heavily engaged with IPB even today. And also I'd like to introduce Anu Chenoy, a former member, uh, a former Dean of International Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi, and currently a professor at the Jindal University in in India. And of course, uh, Anu has been uh, a very important uh, uh, leader in the Asia Europe People's Forum, uh, particularly uh, providing uh, excellent analysis uh, in, in many uh, areas of concern on peace and security. And finally, we have Walden Bellio, who I'm sure <laughs> you all know, uh, and just to say that he was a former member of the Philippine uh, Congress and currently a distinguished, I don't know what it's called, I forgot, you know, a, a distinguished special lecturer at the City University of New York in the US. So uh, I hope Walden will correct, correct me if I did not give the, the proper introduction. 
Okay. Um, now, um, as I said, uh, don't be don't be shy or afraid to call our distinguished panel today. You can call them by their first name uh, when you are to ask question or during our discussion, uh, and without you know uh, going any further. And uh, I would like to call on Joseph Gerson to give us give his introductory remarks. Uh, Joseph. Thank you, Cora. It's uh, good to see a number of, of friends and, uh, and others here, and uh, on we go. Uh, so these are tough times. A few years ago, Walden wrote a book about counter-revolution uh, with Trump and Vance, two classical fascists. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, our recent Supreme Court decisions and the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 here in the U.S., we are approaching the climax of an American counter-revolution. It is not going to be pretty. Clearly, Biden is no gift to the world. Uh, recently, senior arms control, a senior arms control diplomat who is close to Ron Klain, uh, President Biden's first chief of staff, said that only three people can convince Biden to step aside. Uh, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, and Biden's sister. Uh, there are reports that Pelosi will inform Biden that it's time to go, but there are no guarantees that she will, that if she does, he will step aside, or if he does step aside, that the Democrats will be able to come up with a candidate who can beat Trump and his dishonest lackey, Vance. Then to the subject at hand, the desperate, probably futile, uh, and multifaceted U.S. campaign to contain China, uh, and my focus here is on the lattice-like lattice -like network of U.S. alliances across what is now being called the Indo-Pacific. Uh, as the NATO summit declaration put it, uh, the threat as seen from Washington is, quote, global and interconnected. With the passing of the post-Cold War uh, and its unilateral um, era uh, and the relative decline of U.S. power, Washington has become increasingly dependent on alliances across the Indo-Pacific and in Europe, in order to contain uh, Chinese and Russian ambitions. Hence, the increasing integration of NATO with an array of Indo-Pacific alliances, some of which date from World War II's transformation of the Pacific into an American lake, and others of more recent vintage. Over the last two and a half decades, uh, over the last two and a half decades, there's been remarkable continuity uh, in the United States. Republican and Democratic administrations, with each understanding, as Biden's national security statement put it, that China is the only competitor with both the means and the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military, and technological power to advance that objective. Bush the lesser planned to focus on China, but was distracted by 9-11. Kurt Campbell and Obama gave us the pivot to Asia. Trump doubled down on the pivot, and despite the Ukraine and Gaza wars, the People's Liberation Army has been Biden's military pacing force, uh, driving us toward what former ambassador, Australian Ambassador Rudd uh, terms an avoidable war. One place to begin is President Biden's statement that the outcome of Prime Minister Kushida's recent state visit to Washington was, quote, the most significant upgrade in our alliance since it was first established. Uh, don't forget, or rather do forget, uh, Japan's peace constitution. Uh, the Japanese government, the, gov the Japanese government certainly has, excuse me, friends, it's just after six here in the morning. Uh, recall that the U.S.-Japan Mutual Security Treaty was secretly forced on Tokyo in 1952 as a requirement to end the United States post-war occupation of Japan. It didn't end the occupation. Okinawa remained occupied until reversion in 1972. Uh, but even the U.S. Consul General in Naha said several years ago <clears throat> that the entire island remains a U.S. base. Excuse me. And while, US, <clears throat> and while U.S. forces are concentrated in Okinawa, they extend across the Japanese archipelago, including a massive U.S. air base in the nation's capital. Think about that, a major foreign military base in the, in the nation's capital. 
The summit with Kashida was designed in part to trump-proof the alliance, and it deepened military cooperation, including joint development of AI, space, technology, uh, and semiconductors. Tokyo was purchasing 400 Tomahawk missiles as part of its now preemptive strike doctrine against China and North Korea, and it was formally announced then. Uh, in something of a role reversal, Tokyo will now export weapons to the U.S. to replenish depleted U.S. stocks that have run low because of the Ukraine war. There will also be a joint operations command, possibly led by a four-star general, and plans are afoot to create a NATO office in Tokyo. Meanwhile, the SDF, Self-Defense Forces in Japan, uh, is building its forces on Okinawan islands in preparation for possible war uh, over Taiwan. This alliance expansion is a keystone of the lattice-like network, uh, which is not centralized along the model of NATO. The deepening of the U.S.-Japan alliance undergirds the tripartite U.S.-Japan-South Korea alliance. Not incidentally, in July, uh, Washington and Seoul signed a nuclear guideline that provides for U.S. deployment in, in July this month, uh, for U.S. deployment of U.S. nuclear assets in and near South Korea. The April biden kashida Marcos summit uh, reiterated Washington's ironclad commitment to the Philippines, while also resol uh, resolving to increase in interoperability between the three nations' militaries as they contest China for dominance in the South China West Philippine Sea. With Australia and Britain, we now have AUKUS. Uh, it will not only provide new nuclear powered submarines to augment US naval forces in the Pacific and Indian Oceans and fatten military industrial complex coffers. It also reinforces Anglo the uh, Anglo Saxon uh, Indo Pacific neocolonialism. Not limited to the Five Eyes intelligence gathering network of the US, the UK, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. It, incre it is increasingly engaged in joint and collaborative military maneuvers uh, from U.S., Australian, New Zealand joint exercises to the dispatch of British warships to the Taiwan Strait. To reinforce this network, U.S., Japanese, Australian, and Philippine military chiefs uh, met recently uh, in, in Honolulu. And as Anne Wright can tell us, uh, we have many European forces involved in the massive RIMPAC naval exercises that are ongoing right now. Despite the hype when it was first convened, the Quad, comprised of the US, Japan, India, and Australia, is not yet a formal alliance. It remains a forum to develop security and economic strategies in the face of China's rise. But keeping its options open, India, uh, which, let's see where I am, I think. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, India, which is engaged in joint military exercises with the U.S. and Japan, uses Quad as a hedge against the possibility of finding it necessary to confront China more directly in the future. There is also deepening integration of Japanese and other U.S. Indo-Pacific uh, Indo allied militaries with NATO. French, Dutch, British, and German warships have all participated in joint maneuvers. Uh, Japanese Prime Minister Kishido, South Korea's President Yoon, uh, New Zealand's Prime Minister Luxon and Australian Pri Deputy Prime Minister mm -hmm. and Defense Minister Marles uh, all showed up last week at NATO summit in Washington. France and Japan have uh, begun talks for reciprocal pacts, uh, uh, troop pacts. Uh, Japan and Italy have declared their strategic partnership, and Britain and Japan and Italy have agreed to develop the next generation fighter. And for another time, of course, there is the other alliance, or more accurately, an entente, that confronts the natus like network, the deepening military integration of China, Russia, North Korea, and Belarus. Uh, there's a section here which I have to cut because my speech is too long, uh, but simply to say that we're, as we're looking at the probability of a Trump presidency or dictatorship, um, his former national security advisor, Robert O'Brien, has written a really major uh, uh, article in Foreign Affairs, which uh, both interprets what Trump did last time around and what he plans for the future. Uh, it was his call for renewed nuclear weapons testing uh, that garnered most of the um, headlines. Uh, but the reality is uh, that that in the speech, uh, in the article, uh, O'Brien is very clear 
uh, that Trump is committed to 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 the U.S. alliances. Um, certainly NATO, with a few caveats, but certainly NATO. And then uh, with his primary focus being on uh, challenging, containing, confronting China uh, with the uh, Asia-Pacific, Indo-Pacific alliances. So then let me just turn to say that I'm sorry that we face exceptionally dangerous and demanding period. Uh, it is clear that we will need to increase and deepen our international collaborations, among them the current work on a vision for common security diplomacy, if, you know, if we're to uh, prevent the absolute worst. And simply to say that uh, I will make my speech available once I've cleaned up the typos, uh, and among other things, you can uh, see uh, O'Brien's uh, major points uh, in that text. So thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Cora, for organizing this. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, well, I, I think that uh, provides a very, a very important uh, introduction and context to the the issue that we are um, uh, um, dealing with today, and um, and also to it is very important to to see the you know the intentions and uh, and and the continuing. Uh, uh, what they call these uh, relation uh, issues that relates to to this uh, to the NATO uh, uh, configuration and how it, it has progressed uh, uh, over the years. Uh, so let me now call on uh, uh, Rainer Brown, who will help us look at this issue in terms of Europe. And I don't know what else he would add to that, uh, but we can always continue to to add on to other discussions. I think it is very important to look at Europe at this point, uh, especially so that we are talking about uh, NATO. So, Rainer? Yeah, thank you, Koa. And you know what I will try to do is to give you an overview about the relations between NATO and the European Union. And I will start with one sentence which said, North Atlantic Treaty Organization is, and I think Joseph underlined this, is a lie. NATO is the global military alliance of the world, and Europe is an important part of the whole game, but it's not any longer the central part of NATO and NATO activities. NATO activities will more and more go to the main focus of Asia. But Europe is an important part. 30 of the 32 NATO countries are European countries. The partnership countries are mainly Asian and partly also Latin American and African countries. What is the role of the European parties, part of the European countries? It is something like the junior partner in NATO. The absolute dominant hegemon in NATO is the United States of America. No decision will be made without the leadership of the United States of America. But it is also wrong to say that the Europeans are only vassals. They have their own interests and bring these interests into NATO as junior partners because the United States and Europe have too many things together in opposition to the new rising countries in the world. They are both defending the 500 years old colonial system, even when the US was never a colony, a colonial system of Western dominance. And NATO is the protection for the Western dominance in the world. This is the leading role of NATO today. And this means the opposition are these countries which are trying to play an independent role or an uprising role by the political and economical power. This is in Europe, definitely Russia. This is China globally, but these are also other countries of the global south. So the relations between the United States and Europe in NATO are the state relations between Hegemon and junior partners which to follow. To give you one example, for these hegemony of the United States is the decision to put or to bring tomahawks and other weapons of first use, nuclear and conventional, for Europe. This was never discussed in NATO. 
It was a decision of the United States of America. And one of their followers, Germany, was immediately following this line. Absolutely against the national interest, because Germany becomes with this, first of all, a war party, and second, all the counter forces, the counter rockets that will come to, to Europe and destroy Europe. But this shows the leadership of the United States, the will of the United States is the main will in, in NATO. What are the key points of the role of the European Union, of the Europeans in NATO? And now I am speaking of the European Union. The first point of the European Union is a continuation of militarization since 2014. It was militarized a little bit before European Union. Now it is an own militarized force in NATO, which could act independently, but never without the infrastructure, the satellites, and the control system of NATO. So it is never an independent autonomous force, but it can act independently when the hegemon of NATO agreed with this. They act independently, for example, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, partly in Kosovo, where they defend the common interests of NATO, but in a burden-sharing situation but in NATO, the main responsibility lies by the European Union and the militarization. What are the key points of the European Union militarization in NATO? The first key point is the GDP to 2% or more. This was decided as a more or less a wish in 2014. Now it's a rule and the European Union countries are mainly following it. And Stoltenberg was proudly declare that 23 of the 32 countries in NATO were following the rule of to give more to give 2%. And now, you know, after the decision of Washington, they go strict and direct to the 3%. The next point is uh, the own military resources and own military programs. These programs are, call, are called PESCO. These are common armament program in Europe. And this means the development of new tanks, new airplanes, new military substructure, new military infrastructure in Europe. This has a common name and a common program. This called is PESCO. PESCO developed 34 projects in all European Union countries. The next important point for this military role of Europe in NATO is the development of a European military industrial complex. More or less, the militarization of Europe brings a new industry, the military industry to Europe with common industries from different countries working together. The key countries are Germany and France, in addition, Italy and Spain. And now by the new missiles, which should be developed after 2016, this include also Poland. Uh, the, the new point is common military intervention of the European Union in African countries and also in Europe. I set the example of uh, of the two countries. The third point is to agree and to follow the line of confrontation to Russia. And this means to put European Union troops to Lithuania, partly to Romania. Lithuania are 5,000 German soldiers and starting at the end of this year for the next years. We have now new troops in Poland, new troops of European Union in Romania. In Romania, they developed together with the United States and under NATO control, they developed a new military base, which is bigger than the Rammstein base in Germany, which is up to now the biggest military base of the United States in Germany, and which is a confrontation point to Russia and to the and surroundings in the Black Sea. They have a common agreement about arms export, European guidelines and European lines for the arms export to other countries. And last but not least, they are having a new a new European Union military headquarter in Brussels where they are coordinating European Union are coordinating their military activities. These are some points which shows the dramatic dimension of the militarization of the European Union in NATO, partly independent, but under the control of NATO. And thank you 
for giving me the chance to inform you about the European Union and the European Union militarization in NATO. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rainer. Uh, the, that was really very comprehensive, yet you've given it in a really uh, very uh, short period. You know, um, it is also uh, a big Who thing. You gave me seven minutes. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, and thank you for that. Uh, actually, um, um, it's important to, <laughs> to know the major players. I would say, uh, I don't know whether that was the term that he used, but uh, for me, uh, clarity in terms of the major players in Europe uh, and their specific roles and interest uh, and their reach and magnitude of their operations and of their, uh, you know, uh, and, and of course you also uh, emphasized, you know, the, uh, current uh, policy uh, in terms of uh, military spending at 2%, which is not actually the maximum, but it is the, what, the floor, the, the lowest expense. And I think there has been a continuing debate when it comes to this, as we also learn when we continue to pursue our campaign on, uh, you know, military spending that we we do uh, one of the major campaigns of the International Peace Bureau. Um, now we, sh we, we now go uh, towards Asia. And I think uh, 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 we're going to ask Walden to, to now speak uh, in terms of, you know, uh, what would be the implications as well with NATO, as we are calling this a a global NATO. Uh, so uh, it's not only <laughs> Europe now, but it, you know, and he and Walden, I think, would be, uh, is here to explain that to us. And uh, I, I think this is something that's really very inform important, as well as alarming, in a sense, <laughs> in addition to what <laughs> Rainer have uh, given us. So Walden, can we have you now? Uh, yes, uh, yes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes, of course. Okay, uh, yes. So I passed on the slides. And so can we have the uh, slide one? Hello. Uh, is the slide there? Something's... We're uh, pulling it up. Yeah. Just tell me when it's available. There's something. Okay. Okay, you should be good now. I can or, see the first slide. Okay, so first slide. So uh, crisis of the West, opportunity for the rest. Uh, uh, slide two, please. Um, okay, I can't see it for some reason. But uh, in any event, um, now whether we call it the poly crisis, like Columbia University professor Adam Tooze or the age of catastrophe, like the distinguished Marxist Alex Kalinikos, there is no doubt that we are living in a period where the very foundations of the contemporary world order are cracking. There is that enigmatic line Gramsci used to describe his era that is also appropriate for ours. And I quote, the old world is dying and the new world struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. Uh, what I will focus on is a key dimension of the poly crisis, the unraveling of the global hegemony of the United States. Now, the downspin of the U.S. empire has had a number of causes, but key among them are military overextension, neoliberal globalization, and the crisis of the liberal political and ideological order. Let us discuss each in turn. Now, overextension refers to the gap between the ambitions of a hegemon and its capacity to achieve those ambitions. It is almost synonymous with the concept of overreach as used by the historian Paul Kennedy, 
The slight difference being that overextension as I use it is principally a military phenomenon. Now the struggling empire the United States is today is a far cry from the unipolar power it was a quarter of a century ago in 2000. Now, if we ask ourselves what led to this situation, we inevitably come across one individual, Osama bin Laden. Slide three, please. Now, the aim of bin Laden's attack on the Twin Towers on September 11, 2001, was precisely to provoke the overextension of the empire by forcing it to fight on several fronts in the Muslim world that would be inspired to revolt by his dramatic action. Now, but instead of igniting revolt, Osama's act ignited revulsion and disapproval among most Muslims. September 11 would have been a big failure had not George W. Bush seen it as an opportunity to use American power to reshape the world to reflect Washington's unipolar status. He took Osama's bait and launched the U.S. into two unwinnable wars in Afghanistan and Iraq. The results have been devastating for America's power and prestige. During the June 7, 2024, 2024 debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, Trump referred to the defeat in Afghanistan as the worst humiliation ever inflicted on the United States. Now, Trump, as we know, is prone to exaggeration, but there was a strong element of truth in his statement. According to CIA analyst Nell Lahoud, and I quote, Though the 9-11 attacks turned out to be a pyrrhic victory for Al-Qaeda, bin Laden still changed the world and continued to influence global politics for nearly a decade, unquote. If the U.S. is the confused and groping global power it is today, one that has been moreover reduced to a dog being wagged by the Zionist tail, this is not to an insignificant degree due to bin Laden. To acknowledge the significance of 9-11 is not, of course, to endorse it. Indeed, for most of us, the attack on civilians was morally repelling. But one must give the devil his due, as they say. That is, our point, point out the world historic impact of the deed of an individual, be this a person, a saint, or a villain. Slide four, please. Uh, let us now turn to the second cause of the unraveling of the U.S. hegemonic status, neoliberal globalization. Now, 30 years ago, U.S. corporate capital, along with the Clinton administration, envisioned globalization achieved through trade investment and financial liberalization as the spearhead towards this greater domination of the global economy. Wall Street and Washington were wrong. It was China that was the biggest beneficiary of globalization and the U.S. one of its main victims. Now, investment liberalization meant billions of dollars worth of U.S. corporate capital flowed to China to take advantage of labor that could be paid at fraction of the wages paid labor in the U.S. in exchange for technology transfer, voluntary or force, that helped China comprehensively develop its economy. Trade liberalization made China the manufacturer of the world, supplying the U.S. market with cheap products. Both investment and trade liberalization contributed to the deindustrialization of the U.S. and the loss of millions of manufacturing jobs, which declined some 17.3 million jobs in 2000 to around 13 million today. Compounding the deleterious effects of the industrialization have been the financialization of the U.S. economy that is making the super profitable financial sector the leading edge of the economy and regressive taxation, which led to an extremely inequitable distribution of wealth and income. Slide five. Next slide, please. So China has traded places with the U.S. in the global economy. China is now the center of global capitalist accumulation or, in the popular image, the locomotive of the world economy. According to IMF calculations, China accounted for 28% of all growth worldwide from 2013 to 2018, which is more than twice the share of the United States. What must be underlined is that while the U.S. followed neoliberal policies of giving full play to market forces, China selectively liberalized with a powerful China state guiding the process, protecting strategic sectors from foreign control and aggressively demanding advanced technology from Western corporations in exchange for cheap labor. Although in dollar terms, the U.S. still the biggest economy by some measures, like the world's bank's purchasing power parity, PPP, China is now the largest. 11.5% of the people in the United States now live in poverty, whereas according to the World Bank, only 2% of Chinese population is poor. So, of course, China has faced challenges in its rise to world's economic summit. But 
Development, as the economist, economist Albert Hishman points out, is a necessarily unbalanced process. China's crises are crises of growth compared to the U.S. crises, which are crises of decline. So military overextension and the effects of neoliberal economics have contributed not simply to political disaffection, but to political turmoil in the United States, with one of the two major parties, the Republican Party, becoming a spearhead of far-right or fascist politics, fueled by racism, anti-immigrant sentiment, fear, and decline in economic status among white people. Politics has become severely polarized, and some warn that there is now a state of de facto civil war. In short, the political and ideological regime of liberal democracy is now in grave danger with millionaires and progressives warning that Trump's plan 2025 will amount to the establishment of a fascist dictatorship. They are not wrong. Here is what Steve Bannon, the ideological chief of the U.S. far right, says, and I quote, the historical left is in full meltdown. They always focus on noise, never on signal. They don't understand that the MAGA movement, um, make America great again, as it gets mo mo momentum and builds, is moving much farther to the right than President Trump. We're not, unre we're not reasonable. We're unreasonable because we're fighting for a republic and we're never going to be reasonable until we get what we achieve. We're not looking to compromise. We're looking to win, unquote. A second Trump presidency is now a certainty with a stronger possibility that the de facto civil war could turn into an armed civil war. Indeed, the assassination attempt on Trump on July 13, whoever carried it out, may well be a major step towards the unrestrained violence depicted in Alex Garland's movie, Civil War. Now, Washington has been the guardian of the international order. And with the economic and political crisis of the United States, that order has also entered into a deep crisis. Now, what are the key aspects of what has been characterized as the liberal international order? First of all, global leadership of the United States and the West underpinned by U.S. military power and military alliance, the principal one being NATO. Second, a multilateral order that serves as a political canopy for Western capital whose mainstays are the World Bank, the IMF, and the World Trade Organization. Third, an ideology that promotes Western-style democracy as the only legitimate political regime. This order is what Biden extolled during his press conference on June 7, 2024. It is an anachronistic order, and Biden's defense of NATO sh showed him to be an anachronism. Several times he referred to America as, quote, the indispensable nation, unquote, parroting Madeleine Aragon, uh, Albright's arrogant line and presented himself as the prime defender of the country's Cold War alliances, NATO in Europe, the US, Japan, Korea military complex in Asia and Israel. This role as global sheriff is precisely what a very significant section of the electorate is tired of playing owing to the high cost it has entailed, not only in terms of subsidizing those allies, but even more in terms of what many perceive as the way Preserving the empire has come at the expense of the U.S. economy and the living standards uh, of the people. The next slide, please. Trump, on the other hand, understands that ordinary Americans have become weary of Kennedy's Cold War promise of that Americans, quote, shall pay any price, bear any burden, fear, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe in order to assure the survival and success of liberty, unquote. Trump knows that this strong reluctance to continue bearing the burdens of empire extends from left to right, and he has opportunistically played on it to advance his far-right agenda. That he distrusts and dislikes NATO is a point the Biden people have stressed several times. Slide, uh, next slide, please. So the liberal order is now in trouble in two fronts. In the international front, it has lost legitimacy among the global South that sees the multilateral system as designed mainly meant to keep it down. Internally, the liberal democracy that is guiding uh, ideology is, is under assault from the far right. If the far right comes to power in the United States and key states in Europe, and it may come to power soon in France and soon after that in Germany, the international order they would favor would probably continue to assert Western economic supremacy, but adopt a much more unilateralist approach, more protectionist approach of securing it instead of using NATO and the IMF World Bank WTO complex. Certainly, the far right will abandon its hypocritical appeal to liberal democracy uh, as a model for the rest of the world. I'm finishing up. Um, 
So China says it is not out to displace the United States as a global hegemon. To the U.S. elite, however, China is a revisionist power that is determined to dislodge it as the global hegemon. And especially over the Biden years, it has become more and more determined to use that dimension of hegemony where it enjoys um, absolute superiority over China, military power, to protect its status as number one. This is why the danger of war between the United States and China is not to be underestimated. And this is the reason the Western Pacific is such a powder keg, far more than Ukraine. Since while in Ukraine, the U.S. and China confront each other through proxies, Russia and NATO, in the Pacific, they confront each other directly. Uh, slide 11 uh, basically you know, shows the U.S. Uh, uh, military complex in the Asia Pacific and the uh, dangers of war uh, stemming from coalitions. Um, and um, in the absence of any rules of conflict resolution, the only thing preventing conflict is the balance of power. But balance of power regimes are prone to break down often with catastrophic results, as was the case in 1914, when the collapse of the U European balance of power led to World War I. Now, with Washington aggressively marshalling Japan, South Korea, the Philippines, five key air forces of the U.S. Navy, NATO, and the newly created AUKUS, that um, the chances of a rupture in the East Asian balance of power are becoming more and more likely, or perhaps just a collision away. Uh, now I'm going to make a conclusion. So what does the future hold? Some say a hegemonic transition, whether peaceful or not, is inevitable. But let us pose another possibility. Perhaps we should be looking not so much as a hegemonic transition, but the emergence of a hegemonic vacuum akin to, but not exactly the same as that which followed the First World War in the 20th century, when the weakened Western European states had ceased to have the capacity to restore their pre-war global hegemony, while the United States did not follow through on Woodrow Wilson's push for Washington to assert global its hegemonic political and ideological leadership. Within such a vacuum or stalemate, the U.S.-China relationship would continue to be critical, but with neither actor being able to decisively manage trends, such as extreme weather events, growing protectionism, the decay of the multilateral system that the United States placed in, put in place during its apogee, the resurgence of progressive movements in Latin America, the rise of authoritarian states, and the likely emergence of an alliance among them to displace a faltering liberal democratic order and increasingly uncontrolled tensions between radical Islamist regimes in the Middle East and Israel. Both conservative and li liberal policymakers paint this scenario to understand why the world needs a hegemon. But do we really, you know, uh, read, uh, um, is a hegemon really necessary at this point? There are those, and I'm one of them, who view the current crisis of U.S. hegemony as offering not so much anarchy, but opportunity. While there are risks and great dangers involved, a hegemonic stalemate or a hegemonic vacuum opens up the path to a world where power could be more decentralized, where there could be greater freedom of political and economic maneuver for smaller, traditionally less privileged actors from the global South, playing off the two superpowers against one another, where a truly multilateral order can be constructed through cooperation rather than be imposed either unilateral or liberal hegemony. Slide 13, please. Uh, yes, the crisis of U.S. hegemony may lead to an even deeper crisis, but it may also lead to opportunity for us. To use Gramsci's image that I began this essay with, we might be entering an age of monsters. But like Ulysses, we cannot avoid going through the dangerous passages between Shilla and Charybdis if we are to get to the promised safe harbor. Last slide, please. Thank you. Thank you, Walden. Wow. <laughs> what a grim picture you've, you've, uh, you've shown us, but at the same time, ending with a, you know, a hopeful note. And I guess that seems also to be a challenge to all of us. Uh, if we, uh, you know, at, at the closing, uh, there's of course a lot of work to do. And I hope that, uh, what we are doing today would somehow help us understand the contours and the 
and uh, you know, and and how to understand all this that's happening. Um, I now call on Anu Chenoy <laughs> um, to uh, provide us uh, further with uh, her analysis and her and her uh, you know uh, views on uh, the implications of the global NATO. Uh, I hope Thank you. I, I'm looking forward to a more positive <laughs> conclusion at this point. So please, Anu. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Cora, IPB, APF for uh, organizing what I think is a very important uh, webinar because it comes just after the NATO meeting and the protests in Washington of No to NATO. Uh, I think um, the document of uh, that came out as a joint declaration is being studied very carefully world over. And I'm going to do try and do a quick decoding of this document because in essence, in those three pages, it actually points to what all the previous speakers have said. So I'm very going to do that and then give some of the challenges. So the first thing which is running through this document is a fact of escalation. It is a, a step up on the escalatory ladder of NATO itself. It's an escalation of threats rather than threat perceptions because these threats on the ground have not changed as visibly as NATO is presenting it. And of course, these threats are been framed to suit the current NATO agenda, which is of maintaining hegemony. So China, for example, has been mentioned 14 times in this three page document. And so how is China a sudden bigger threat than it was in the last Vilnius meeting document? And they talk about it as a dis decisive enabler of the Ukraine conflict. Now, how is it suddenly a they're putting the blame, shifting the blame from Russia to China? Of course, Russia is also the number one obsession, but I'm going to go into that in a minute. The other thing is they're also in this document, they've targeted Iran and North Korea. But throughout this meeting, they have not once spoken of Gaza and Palestine, not of spoken of negotiated settlements. So this whole thing is about security paranoia. And uh, it, it runs through this that they're sp trying to spread the security paranoia, not just to NATO constituencies, but to the world through this document. Uh, because it knows that everyone, everyone's going to be analyzing it um, and um, to their own constituencies. Uh, so, however, the very first challenge to NATO itself is that almost the entire global south, excluding the few new allies of NATO, do not share this security threat perception. They do not want this protection from NATO because it says that there is a security threat and NATO will provide uh, the protection globally. The second trend running through the document is expansionism beyond the transatlantic um, remit, which uh, has been shown uh, by uh, Reiner and um, uh, Joseph. And to justify this, they have redefined the NATO concept of security itself as a, quote, 360 degree approach, where it says global, the threats are global and interconnected, that NATO is indispensable and its security is indivisible. So therefore, whether it's Pacific or, or all the oceans, they, they connect it that it is they who are going to safeguard it just as uh, you know, they, they did during the, the, the colonial regime. So now, um, of course, they're expanding to um, Indo-Pacific, which they say is the most strategic and important for European security and Middle East and Africa. So they're going to be new regional centers in Kuwait, a liaison officer office in Jordan, a NATO mission in Iraq, 
uh, in addition to the fact that 50 NATO countries have military bases in Africa, in addition to the fact that there's Russian, Chinese, and Turkish military presence. So you're going to be seeing a lot of new conflicts, not just uh, in the Indo-Pacific, but also uh, in Africa. In Africa where uh, and the Red Sea, where they could not manage the Houthis, where after 20 years of war, NATO replaced the Taliban with the Taliban. So we're going to see much more of it. And of course, they have revived the dominoes theory, uh, where um, which was there in Southeast Asia, uh, you know, that if one Vietnam falls, then the others will fall. It's They revived this for Europe, that if Ukraine falls, then Central uh, East European countries will also fall. They've revived the Monroe Doctrine. So the very traditional um, imperial theories have been revived uh, in specifically in this doc in this document. Then, of course, they operationalize this conceptualization. And how are they operationalizing it? Through the model of proxy wars, which is a new format. Of course, the classic proxy war is Ukraine, but the new proxies are being prepared. Uh, and it may not seem like that, but we have to remember that Ukraine, it was decided that they would be a proxy since 2008. And the, um, you know, the color revolution, et cetera, uh, took place many years later. So in the same way, I believe they are preparing the new proxies, which could be uh, Taiwan, the Philippines, or South Korea, or even any small uh, Micronesian island like Micronesia, but it will be there in the Asia Pacific. And Japan is going to also be a great bridgehead uh, for this. It's it's very clear. So NATO is acting actually like a parasite. It, this proxyism is actually parasitism, where uh, the these these are also they are the proxy members of NATO. Uh, who've been invited uh, for the uh, NATO meeting. They'll never be the full members, but they are going to be proxy members like Ukraine and then Philippines and um, uh, the others. The fourth, the other operational point is burden sharing, which um, Reiner explained very well, but I have a slightly uh, different take on it in which it is not just that uh, two percent defense expenditure, but it is the interoperability agreements of bases across the world, including, for example, even India, which is not part of their proxy planning. Uh, burden sharing uh, is also uh, sharing of body bags. Uh, burden sharing is handing Ukraine the Ukraine war to Europe as they move in, the US moves into the Asia Pacific. So burden sharing is just a, a signifier for a lot of burden sharing. It's not just defense. Uh, it includes um, uh, uh, the body bags, which the uh, Americans and at least the Western part of Europeans don't want, but Central East Europe or uh, others would be part of the body bag burden sharing. So NATO has become the enabler for US foreign policy as very clearly shown, but I just lost my point want to show the parallel discourse which is coming from the global south. Uh, so whatever document you take, which is coming from the global south, whether it is from the uh, group of 77, it's from the non-aligned group, whether it is from ASEAN, uh, whether it's from the BRICS, which, which is the biggest demon for the West currently, but they are all talking of a parallel discourse. And this discourse is, they're talking, they're saying we don't want, unipo it's not in negative terms, but they're saying they want, number one, multipolarity, which is a dispersal of centralized power. Uh, it could be multinodal. They're not, they're, so they're saying anti-hegemony, whereas Many others are saying that actually there are regional hegemons there, like India, China, et cetera. But at the same time, uh, they're talking about a, ba a better balance of power. And I think the uh, UN Security General also said this about multipolarity, that if it is matched with institutions, it would be a much better balance of power than currently. So all the entire global South, the majority of it is talking about 
multipolarity. They're invested in it and they are constructing it every day with their own alliances. Uh, they're talking about national sovereignty and not giving away their choice of someone else managing their security because they know what that does. You give away your choice of managing security, you're going to undermine your other choices. Uh, they, they want to democratize international institutions. Uh, they, um, uh, so they're not saying we want an end or completely alternate in institutions, though they have made the new development bank, the so-called BRICS bank, uh, et cetera. But they're saying the old institutions, the UN, the Security Council, the World Bank, et cetera, must uh, be reformed to reflect the new voices. They may not get very far, but they are pushing it on a daily basis in every meeting, whether it's from the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or um, from the non-aligned movement, et cetera. Then they're asking for strategic autonomy uh, and um, a different form of security, and which is non-militarist. So no one in the global south has really uh, a militarist alliance. There is no militarist alliance uh, like NATO, even though it's been said that um, uh, maybe, um, you, you know, uh, Russia could have some, but R Russia is not really part of the global south, but the global south does not fear or have a, feel a security threat with Russia, and they're willing to work with it uh, very closely, as you saw recently uh, with the Indian prime minister meeting with uh, uh, Putin on the day of the NATO meeting. Even though the Americans and the State Department, as well as the American ambassador here, said that they were extremely unhappy about it, and they said in a public speech that there is no such thing as neutrality. You're either with us or against us. But I think countries like India, Brazil, South Africa, at least, uh, just yesterday we had a BRICS meeting here, I was present, uh, where they all opposed this. And they said that we do not want to be, we will remain neutral and non-aligned. Uh, it may not be as progressive as earlier, but it's transactional, it is pro-peace. And if there is a, a third war, the countries which are not, it will not be a world war because the countries of the global south are not going to be part of it. So it can be a European war against any target, whether it's, you know, they don't want to say it'll be against uh, China. Uh, but they're saying that uh, the, th the global south is not going to be part of this war and they're going to stick to these principles of, no, just, uh, like Vietnam has said, no to uh, the three no's, uh, no to any uh, military alliance, no to any military bloc, no to siding with any country at war with the other, and so on. So um, much of the global south is, for their own benefit, going to tr try and negotiate with both sides, the side of the US and the collective West on one, and China and Russia on the other, even when they have disputes, like India has a border dispute, with unsettled, somewhat calm, but nonetheless, it's there. Vietnam has one. Many of the ASEAN countries have it, but look at the ASEAN documents. They're always talking about the possibility of some codes of conduct. They haven't been put in place, but they are not talking the NATO language. So this is where the challenge is coming from. And of course, from the peace movement, uh, which is being defunded, demonized, uh, and marginalized, but it is there. Thank you uh, very much. Thank you, Anu. Uh, wow. Um, uh, thank you so much for, you know, uh, uh, bringing up those, uh, you know, the strategies, uh, areas of cooperation. In fact, uh, uh, it, it's very important that you unpack the uh, you know, the strategies and the intentions that are there, but at the same time, uh, telling us what it means, you know. Uh, and uh, I, I think uh, with what you have kind of told us about how it is in, in this region, you know, in the Global South, that's that has been a very useful thing. It could be uh, encouraging, but at the same time, it is also a challenge to look at 
you know, possible uh, areas of uh, continuing work and emphasis in our organizing work in the peace and justice movement. Uh, so um, I, I think we move on. We're almost uh, kind of, we're practically more than halfway with our roundtable discussion. Uh, but I think uh, at this point, it would be good to have our four panelists to kind of uh, 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 have an exchange and um, uh, further uh, for further deepening of uh, the four areas that has been uh, provided. And uh, I, I think uh, it would be good to start with uh, um, uh, what Anu have uh, mentioned about the, uh, the 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 picture or the the uh, the nature of NATO no? uh, and its operations uh, even outside of Europe. So uh, I I wonder. Who would want to uh, <laughs> expound on that further? Uh, Rainer, would you like to begin? <laughs> you know, the only thing I can begin is the actual development with the tomahawks in Europe. You know, this is the way back to 79. It's the next second time that they are trying to put first use weapons to Europe under even more difficult circumstances than 79. 79, the decision was to combine bringing new nuclear weapons to Europe with a negotiation offer. And then there starts this negotiation in Geneva. This time, the decision of the United States and Germany was only to put new nuclear weapons to Europe. And it's obviously that these new nuclear weapons, these are the Tomahawks and the anti-missiles, and above all the hyperonic weapons, that this will feel bring reactions from Russia. And this means we will have the old story on Europe, rockets are, are magnets. And it is very disturbing situation for Europe. And I cannot see any politi political leader in Europe who is willing to go for an alternative path. And I think it is really the big job of the peace movement to revitalize the ideas and the philosophy of common security. I think this is the huge biggest challenge which we are facing in Europe. We are really in a very dangerous situation and we are trying everything to bring together a new coalition of opposition against this militarization. Today we launched an appeal from social democrats and other peace activists and left guys against the new a European nuclear weapons in Europe, and we will see if we are able to develop a bigger movement against these kind of weapons. It's a really very dangerous situation. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, thanks, Joseph, Anu, and Rainer. Uh, I would just like to um, say that uh, I think I see the current period as dangerous, yes but it's also a time for opportunity. And I think that uh, the first thing I would just like to say is that is this, 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 this rise of China and the crisis of US capital and the US state uh, provides the opportunity precisely for the actors that Anna was talking about in the global South to become much more assertive Playing off the big superpowers against one another, um, you know, getting, you, you know, uh, but, you know, that's been going on for the last few decades. And uh, I think that will uh, accelerate at, at this point in time. So the thing I would just like to emphasize is danger, yes, but also opportunity. And for the global south, it's very important to have that space. Mm -hmm. that this competition is now bringing about, which is why the Global South has basically not wanted to be boxed in to the European-Russia-Ukraine issue um, because they, they see that's really um, 
um, a blind alley to go into. Uh, so I think that's that's the first thing I would just like to say that even as we acknowledge the dangers, let's also see this as um, uh, opportunity. And, you know, um, uh, unfortunately, in the case of the Philippines, the Philippines is probably the exception to the more, you know, uh, um, uh, more hopeful efforts in the rest of the global south uh, <laughs> to to make use of this space, you know, but we can go into that later. The second thing I would like to say is NATO really belongs to the past. It belongs to the liberal international order of which Biden is so central. And I think that my point was that there are two challenges to this now that are emerging. One is from the Global South that we've already talked about. And the Global South is happy that U.S. has become uh, weaker. Um, there are some things that we don't want to acknowledge, but they have to be pointed out. That's why I began with Osama bin Laden. Um, however we think of the guy, whether he was a villain or whatever, he did provide a very important key to unraveling the U.S. empire in the Middle East. Okay. Uh, and uh, so the point, second point I would just like to say is that that liberal order is now in, in crisis. And despite its expansionist rhetoric, NATO is actually on the defensive. Uh, NATO is actually on the defensive, you know, if, if, if we look at it, um, and it's the U.S. Uh, uh, dragooning NATO into the Asia Pacific. Uh, and I think Biden has been very clear, and the Democrats have been very clear about this, that they cannot risk a change in the U.S. political uh, regime. Um, because, um, um, you know, part of... Uh, the base of Trump has been a resentful base that feels that carrying the burdens of empire has resulted uh, in the weakening of the United States, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is why uh, Trump has been uh, basically very down on NATO, uh, rhetorically at least, uh, and, uh, and, and, and Biden's... Um, uh, Biden is, is right that um, NATO will enter some sort of a big crisis if Trump comes to power um, because um, it's not, um, uh, I know that uh, there was the point that was raised by Joe about a former advisor to Trump, but let's, let's uh, I think that uh, Trump has been very, very critical of these alliances. Uh, and it's not just him. There's a base within the MAGA that is, in fact, quite critical uh, of alliances like NATO because they think that that's really dragged the United States down. So um, that related to that is, uh, let's face it, um, you have a non-liberal um, uh, um, uh, sector a political sector in Europe that is now on the ascendant. Uh, this is the the uh, the the the, um, the right the far right, um, and we need to factor that in because NATO has been basically an alliance that's been built on the center right and center left parties of the past. So what's going to happen when you now have um, you know? the right-wing parties coming to power that don't share the same liberal containment worldview. I mean, that's something that we really need to talk about because I, I think that um, there, what's going to happen here is there might be more unilateralist efforts, uh, whether it's in Europe or in the United States, um, to, 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 to push uh, uh, America's uh, agenda. Um, and um, so my sense is that the U.S. regime is coming into crisis domestically and Trump uh, is going to win. 
in November. And that's going to have very negative implications in terms of the internal consensus of NATO. And I think what we need to do is we need to take advantage of that dissensus that is emerging within NATO to really weaken it drastically. I'll, I'll jump in here with, with a few points. Okay, uh, Joseph. <laughs> as, 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 always, as, as always, Walden is very much on point um, to say that in, in O'Brien's article, one of the things he says is that Trump is um, driven by his instincts uh, rather than by uh, analysis or, 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 or advice. Um, a very, very dangerous figure. So just a, a few things to um, to add here. Um, first of all, what you what you read in, in what Trump says himself is I think he's been playing a very ambiguous game here in relationship to NATO. And what both Trump and O'Brien argue is that this has allowed him to uh, press the burden sharing and to get a lot more money uh, for NATO. Uh, and I think this is going to continue uh, to 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 be the game. Um, you know, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking, um, all of you, uh, how good it is to be outside the United States. Um, you know, we are entering into this very, very dangerous period. I, I liked Walden's reference to um, Gramsci and still in Charybdis. Uh, I feel in some ways here in the United States, we're absolutely in the eye of that storm as Trump is about to come to power. He's promised us a dictatorship on the first day. And Project 2025 uh, is, is a um, vision for basically revamping the U.S. government. I mean, one of the things that's out there in, in, in Project 2025 and also in um, Trump's campaign speeches uh, is a commitment to deport as many as 20 million uh, immigrants. Uh, think about what that means in terms of the transformation of, of American society at so many different levels. I mean, to enforce that, you've got to have a police state. Uh, talk about crisis of capitalism. Uh, without those workers, the U.S. economy moves much deeper uh, into, into crisis. And um, you know, the plan with 2025 is to get rid of about half of the civil service and replace it with, with, with Trump loyalists, which is to say, you know, fascist, fascist implementators. So the situation here domestically for those, for those of us who are being critical uh, and certainly for many others, people of color, especially uh, is going to be very, very dangerous. And as Walden is saying, uh, th th this really marks the end uh, of a liberal order here in the United States. It marks the end of constitutional democracy. It's not just Trump, but we had the decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, so the degree to which the United States and, uh, and U.S. liberalism remains a model is gone, or uh, will be gone. Um, and it's just been uh, quite remarkable to watch uh, Biden, both him twisting in the wind and having us all twist in the wind. Um, I guess the the the... The last thing to say here, uh, I had the privilege of, of living in Europe for three years uh, after uh, the Paris Peace Accords were negotiated, which we thought had ended the Vietnam War. And I had the rare privilege of um, meeting and working with a number of people who've been involved in the nonviolent and to a lesser degree, the violent resistance to Nazi rule. Uh, yeah, I've certainly done my reading. Uh, and, you know, it feels here in the United States like we're entering a period not unlike the 1930s in, in Europe. Very, very dangerous. Certainly, certainly McCarthy era, but I think, I think more dangerous uh, than that. And I think the U.S. left is not at all prepared for this. Um, there's very little discussion going on at the moment. Uh, and what we think of in terms of strategies for getting through navigating Scylla and Charybdis uh, are not there. This is this is a real challenge for us, uh, and clearly the um, support of international colleagues and friends and allies is going to be very very important. Um, some of us, I'm, I'm remembering, Walden had to come into exile here in the United States during the Marcos dictatorship. Um, you know, 
for some of us here that might become what we need. Uh, it's a dark, it's a dark, dark period. Um, well, not not to laugh, Cora. Uh, not to laugh. Um, yeah, I, I've I, I I did I did organizing uh, in Arizona of all places uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, and so I've I've and I and I began my organizing uh, going south in the civil rights movement. So I know the viciousness of these people. I mean, you can't go even in a in a in a, in a state like New Hampshire, uh, near near Massachusetts, uh, or even in New York. Uh, you have many armed uh, militias. Um, you can't have a a, a, a nonviolent demonstration uh, of people of color in in Concord, New Hampshire, um, the capital of the state, uh, without uh, armed militias coming out with their guns uh, to intimidate and to signal. Uh, and you know the reality is, uh, it, it seems it seems. I mean, if, if, even if Biden can be moved aside, it seems most unlikely uh, that the Democrats are going to be able to prevail in this election. Uh, but there also is the reality uh, that um, uh, in, 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 in case in case Trump actually does lose. Uh, there's going to be a legal contest on the one hand with the Supreme Court weighing in for Trump. And on the other hand, armed militias, uh, you know, the, the January 6th, 20, 2021, you know, was no accident. The forces are still there. So I, I think we need to understand this dimension of, of what the United States is, uh, where we're going, uh, and its, its implications, you know, for NATO, for people across Asia Pacific. I mean, we're in a period of, of, of uh, you know, the, the ideology is about power. Uh, and, um, uh, and I think, I think Walden was talking about uh, the, the, the rise to the increasing danger of unilateralism. Uh, certainly from the United States, that's what we're going to see. Thank you, Joseph. I, you know, I wish I could call on Rainer immediately, but, uh, Anu has to leave in a while and for some urgent family um, emergency. So uh, I'd like to ask her uh, if there is a question in the chat box that she would like to answer or give us her concluding remarks. Uh, no, I think uh, I th there was just one point that I missed out when I was talking about uh, the global South and how it's trying to um, uh, emerge independently. And uh, one thing is, uh, you know, there's this debate on de-dollarization. Of course, it's not going to be de-dollarization, but what the Global South is doing to have a material basis in multipolarity, of multipolarity, that all these, a lot of these countries are trading with each other in their own currency. Uh, and the New Development Bank is giving out 50% of its loans in national currencies. So um, about 70% of India's trade with Russia is in the rupee ruble. Uh, a lot of trade, and now China and Russia are India's biggest trading partners. It's going into billions. Uh, India's trade with a number of ASEAN countries is in rupee ruble. Um, similarly, uh, China's trade with ASEAN, with Russia, almost 90% of Russian Chinese. So they are trying to bypass the dollar. But at the same time, the contingent, I mean, the reserve, the dollar remains a reserve currency and all the bonds and treasury bonds and debt and the trillions of that are still dominated by the dollar. But nonetheless, uh, what I'm trying to say is that the Global South is making every effort to retain uh, their vision of multipolarity, uh, strategic autonomy, non-alignment, et cetera. And nobody knows who's going, whether they're going to be able to sustain it. And I think, I, and I would say this to Walden, a lot depends on China. Yes. If China <clears throat> does not assert its vision of its own um, historic borders, and push into areas of uh, Vietnam or islands in the South China Sea, which it is, or India, then they could have an, a you know, better engagement with China. Otherwise, uh, the US is there every day 
trying to push all these countries uh, into their network. Thanks, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Anu. Uh, well, we, we look forward to more interactions with you in the future. Uh, and thank you so much. Um, we have several questions that are already in the chat. And one of them, I think, uh, is coming from Rafi Chaudhuri. And I, I'd like to ask him to give his question. There are a couple of questions that is addressed, uh, that can be addressed to Rainer. And uh, so, Rafi, please. Yeah, of course. Uh, thank you, Cora. So I, I just had a quick question for Walden uh, on his introductory remarks. Uh, firstly, I thought everyone's uh, comments were really enlightening. I'm so happy that I'm here. Um, but in your remarks, you noted that the uh, European balance of powers resulted in a disaster. And I was just wondering, wouldn't this necessarily cast sort of like a negative uh, forecast on a world without like a global hegemon? Because a lot of like uh, sort of NATO activists, they would... Uh, they would attribute the relative peace that we've had for like a couple of decades um, or like because people have coined the last couple of decades as like the world's most peaceful era. Um, and they would attribute that to like uh, the sort of like unipolar status that we have uh, today. And so I was just wondering, like, when necessarily like couldn't it be seen that the sort of parity between powers could maybe lead to like uh, like greater instability? Oh, uh, thank you, Rafi. Uh, well, I was uh, well. First of all, I was um, referring in particular to the situation in the Asia Pacific at this point, where there are no rules of the game. Uh, it's uh, it's strictly military balance of power, and um, because there are no rules of the game, anything from a ship collision, um, even a small ship collision, uh, can immediately escalate to something much much bigger. Uh, and this is the fear of many people, including the Vietnamese who told me when I was visiting them when I was a member of Congress back uh, a few years ago, that, um, you know, no rules uh, means that uh, things can, in fact, um, uh, end up uh, uh, uncontrolled. Um, and this is a, a very dangerous situation at this point in time, especially in the... Um, South China Sea, West Philippine Sea area. Uh, so, uh, so this is what I was referring to. Now, in terms of um, uh, NATO having been, um, um, you know, the um, having been a positive force for uh, peace. Um, well, I, I think it might have prevented. Um, you know, you know, uh, major war from taking place in the center. But one of the things that we've seen ever since 1945 was that uh, wars have been displaced to the periphery, whether it was the Korean War or the Vietnam War and many other wars. Uh, basically, yes, there might have been peace in the center, but you had major wars that took place uh, in the periphery of uh, and um, in fact, uh, you know, many studies have in fact confirmed that the period from 1945 um, uh, to the, the 80s and 90s, uh, you know, you had so many wars that were created uh, that that took place, civil wars, but in which intervention was 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 also uh, an extremely Western intervention was was a major factor. So I would not say that there was have been there has been global peace uh, uh, during this period. Um, uh, what I can say is that wars were uh, displaced from the center uh, into the periphery, and they were just as costly uh, and they were bloody um, wars uh, that that took place. So this idea that um, uh, hegemon and NATO has kept the peace. I think it would not uh, stand. Yeah. But nothing uh, to do with the truth. Yeah, you know, but, but, you know, the, the price was constant turmoil in the third world uh, or the mm. or the uh, global south. So uh, that's what I would say to that 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 comment. Okay. But I, I guess the bigger point I'm saying is that um, that 
I would say that the unipolar status of the United States that it enjoyed back in 1990s, et cetera, uh, I think it's positive that that's gone um, because it has really created space, um, you know, for the global South to 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 breathe, and um, and and especially the rise of China um, in terms of being able to be used as a counterweight, both for development aid and many other things to the United States has been overall, you know, a positive force. Anu has mentioned, you know, that of course there have been some problems in terms of China's behavior, uh, certainly when it comes to, not, not Taiwan, because everybody acknowledges that Taiwan belongs to, to China, but in the, um, in, in the West Philippine Sea or the South China Sea, uh, there are specific um, um, uh, conditions there. Condition. Uh, basically, you know, China is is you know, ha China's even the Pentagon says that China's China's um, uh, strat uh, strategic posture is the strategic defense. Uh, in the West Philippine Sea, however, that is a, a situation whereby China has been because of the exposure of the South and Southeast China coast to massive uh, U.S. Um, military blanket, uh, they have been trying to move their um, defense perimeter outward. Uh, so it's a military tactical move in order to be able to protect the heart of the industrial infrastructure of China. Now, the problem with China is that it has gone on this on in a unilateral fashion uh, instead of negotiating uh, you know because we could the best solution is really a demilitarized and neutral and denuclearized um, uh, South China Sea and uh, that's to be it takes time to do that but that also is the best solution uh, you cannot just have shortcuts and say that 90 percent of this belongs to us so Anu is right um, China has to um, uh, act in a way that is much more uh, less real politic, uh, and um, and you know in order to be able to prevent the United States from uh, you know making use of uh, all of these different actions uh, in its effort to preserve um, its hegemony. Thank you. Well, then, uh, I think uh, there are two questions and also uh, earlier uh, um, Rainer was going to respond to some of the comments that was earlier made by Joseph and maybe by Walden. So uh, there are two questions in the chat box that that seems to be, you know, uh, something that that you have to respond to. Uh, from Roland Kulke and also from Cyril. So, Rainer, can you? Yeah. <laughs> you know, first of all, I think this discussion shows to me how important it is that we exchange about the actual developments in the world. Second point, I absolutely agree with Anu many things. How we can reduce the monster depends from China and the global south. I think they are for a more peaceful development in the world, the key players for the future. So that, and now I really would like to discuss a little bit deeper with Walden. I think for me, for Trump is not interesting in having NATO or he only wants to have NATO when he is doing the main job for the United States. This means spend more military increase the military budget and is helping to save the U.S. dominance in the world. But this is NATO doing. So for me, Trump has only a real tactical relations to NATO. When NATO is doing what he wants, he's supporting NATO. When NATO mm. is a little bit starting in opposition or not fulfill his obligation in his sense, it, he's not interesting any longer in NATO. But my feeling 
and the documents of Washington shows this to me, is that NATO is absolutely willing to fulfill the obligations and what Trump wants from NATO. When you read the documents, for me, the documents are written under President Trump because it is absolutely fulfilled the obligation of more increase and in confrontation with China and not mentioning the whole Israel-Gaza problem where he is very supportive for Israel, in aggressively mentioned North Korea and aggressively mentioned Iran. This is absolutely the Trump line. What is NATO doing? So for me, tactical relations only. Second, what NATO is also doing, and this is the uh, background of the enlargement to the new powers in Asia, is to make bilateral agreements. I think there is no division to say NATO will be stronger and have, having more bilateral agreements between different countries. Yeah. Uh, the, the agreements to, to Japan, to South Korea, they are mainly bilateral agreements. And I'm quite sure that this will be following. Also, these three-lateral agreements between China, between US, Japan, and South Korea are agreements between different NATOs, but under the umbrella and under the challenges of NATO. So between bilateral and strengths of NATO, and above all, increase the expansion and increase the militarization of the region, I cannot see differences. Both are um, part of the same game. The third one I would like to mention, this is a typical is European. Please don't believe that the far right forces in Europe are against NATO. This is an illusion and this is a lie by our liberal politicians to save their lives right. and their political career. When you are looking to the Italian chancellor, she is the biggest supporter of NATO, and she's a fascist. When you are looking to Le Pen and the far right wing in France, they are more or less in favor of NATO. They changed their own program. Now it is mentioned that NATO is an important part for the security system in Europe. The division of the right-wing parties in Europe, in the European Union Parliament, is mainly because they don't have any agreement about their transatlantic politics. And quite a lot, above all the bigger ones, are more or less in favor of NATO. And even Orban, who is created now the new enemy of the European Union, never was saying one word that you want to leave NATO. So please have in mind that also new coalitions, which I can also see in Europe, between the conservatives and the far right, they will continue making this aggressive NATO politics. There will be no change. And the problem, and this is why I have a little bit less hope sometimes, is that also parts of the left are jumping into the NATO boat. So we have a unification of quite all political forces in supporting NATO, more or less. The left says it should not be so aggressive, but we need NATO. So that is for me the point to say what we now need or what we have to think about to discuss it, which is the new coalition of hope. And this new coalition of hope is for me to bring together the global south, including conservative and even far right government in the global south together with the, the parts of the left which are in opposition to NATO with the peace movement which is in the majority also against NATO and other critical societal views in the NATO even when they are partly coming from the conservative far right and from, from the more right side. This is the challenge we are facing to have a coalition of actions and hope for the future. Because, you know, Walden was really great quoting Walden Bell, uh, Wal, uh, Gramsci. Well, Gramsci always in his books underlined the need of who are the actors, who are the subjects of the changes. And I think the difficult situation now we are facing is to find, to bring together the subjects for preventing these horrible NATO politics. That is the challenge we are facing.
And to say one word to Africa, because this was one question, Africa is mentioned in the documents three times, and it is mentioned as a new military partner for NATO, and they want to have more and new military bases. They are looking for these new military bases above all in the northern part of Africa, the Maghreb countries, and in Nigeria. This is the key point after they were kicked out of the whole Sahel zone. So this is the development for, these are the points for NATO. And key players now is Côte d'Ivoire, which they want to have new military bases, partly Chad and the Maghreb countries. Uh, there's uh, one question here also. Uh, what if if not, uh, Rainer? Uh, something about the critical summary of Project Twenty Twenty Five. what is precisely the question? It says, uh, "Can you recommend a critical summary of Project Twenty Twenty Five?" Wait. Um... Yeah, they're, they're coming out. Actually, Krugman had a piece in the New York Times, I believe it was yesterday, um, focusing just on a portion of it. Um, and, you know, the, the biggest, the biggest, it, it's, I mean, some of it's just ridiculous. And there are a number of articles you can probably just Google it at this point. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, just how, how ludicrous it is. Uh, you know, there's a, a thing in there uh, which says, you know, the only decent, legitimate family is one where the father is the breadwinner and the mother raises the kids. Um, I mean, it, it's it's this it, it's this backward thinking. Um, you know, I, I will dig out a few references and I can share them with Cora, uh, who in turn can can share them with 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 the group. Um, I'll I'll do that later today. Okay. Uh, well, we have other questions here. We are almost at the end of our uh, uh, um, roundtable discussion. Uh, but um, I'd like to, and there's Michael Alunan who, who raised his hand. There's also a comment coming from Marivit Rakisa of the University of the Philippines and about Trump is not a threat to the deep state, it says. Geopolitical Economy Report, which uh, she gave the link to the YouTube. And I wonder whether Marivik would like to expound on that, or is it just the uh, information that you have given, Marivik? Uh, yes, just for information in reaction to what uh, Walden was saying. Quite frankly, I haven't read it. My, I haven't listened to it myself, but I just wanted to share it with the group. <laughs> Thank you, Marivik. <laughs> yes, uh, my, Michael? My... Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yes. Well then. No, my only point here is uh, to, you know, to, to what I was bringing out is uh, one is the the opportunities that uh, uh, now exist um, uh, for the global south uh, in uh, in terms of the the crisis of the liberal institutions that have ruled the world uh, since 1945. Uh, and that includes NATO, the IMF, World Bank, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I, I, I think that I guess what I'm trying to point to is let's not just look at the hegemonic aspects, but the crisis of hegemony uh, and how Global South can, uh, can maneuver during this period, and Reiner had had pointed out some of the opportunities there. The second thing is, um, let us not underestimate the differences between the liberals and the far right. Uh, and in the United States, that's um, um, that that uh, you know we we need to look at this much more closely because the far right and Trump have always been denouncing. Uh, the deep state and how parts of the military command uh, are in fact part of the deep state that has um, destabilized him. So um, um, uh, I'm not saying either, you know, is he right or is, is he wrong? Uh, I think that it demands much more um, uh, investigation 
because uh, let me just give you one example. Um, uh, Trump um, uh, was for the ending the U.S. Uh, military commitment to Afghanistan, and in fact, he was. It was under him that the final negotiations took place uh, with the Taliban. Mm. Um, and um, but um, who countermanded that order? Who countermanded that policy? It was the U.S. military command. They were not willing to, uh, in fact, withdraw from Afghanistan. Uh, so you know those those kinds of differences um, uh, would you know are are there. So um, and then when when we look at the Asia Pacific, uh, uh, with which I have much more familiarity on this score, um, you know the U.S. military command is a very powerful institution in its own right, uh, and. Um, um you know they're 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 you know they could uh if say that there was a clamor uh on the part of the right in the US the 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 populist sector to reduce commitments in the Asia Pacific um the military uh, could in fact uh, be an actor that could torpedo any such move uh on the part of Trump if in fact he 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 would undertake something like that. But all I'm trying to say is that between the far right in the US and in Europe and the liberals, there are very important differences that we need to really study at this point in time and not just make any assumptions that a Trump uh, far right um, hegemony uh, will be basically the same as the liberal hegemony that has existed over the last several years, uh, several decades. That's 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 all I'm trying to say. Okay, uh, we have one last question. I think, uh, Michael, is it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Comment. Uh, okay, guess, yeah. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. I just I want to raise uh, a few points. One is uh, so far in the discussion, uh, not there's no mention of the BRICS. And its implication as an alternative to the declining NATO or it's in shambles, no, apparently. And second, uh, we see the uh, wars raging and the imminent uh, the threat of a global war. So, what are the solutions available? Uh, what can we do on a mass scale uh, internally, internationally? Uh, and structurally on from the policy and you know, uh, many others. So and 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 a third point I want to push to uh, build on what Walden mentioned earlier that uh, need to focus on the crisis of the hegemon, which is basically the West, America and Europe. And uh, because if we we'll scrutinize the the West. Over the last few decades, they have shifted towards a financialization and abandoned and exported the production bases, industrial base, to a point that, uh, like, they've exported their industries to, like, China and the third world, to a point because it's natural for the owners of industry, it's more profitable. Like, Nike, for instance, they when they first started in China, they spent only 5% of the uh, production cost. So anyway, uh, the result is the, the decline of the economy in uh, the Western economy, because they even renamed themselves from industrialized countries to the developed countries. So developed, but industry and agriculture have shrunk to the past four or five decades. And what has happened, they have indebted themselves because they realize that they can earn more by borrowing. No? So the oligarchs, no? So what has happened with the, the debts, even the banks too too big to uh too big to fail are now in, in huge debts that can never be paid. So what has happened? Uh and the Federal Reserve cannot keep on bailing out quantitative easings and all of these measures to save the banks. And but many of the the 
financial oligarchs of London and Wall Street, uh, they have invested like BlackRock, for instance, and Vanguard. These are big investment funds. Uh, BlackRock is about $10 trillion. Uh, they, they have investments interlocking directors in the arms industry and in commodities. So when you create war, they make money on the arms industry. And because when wars happen, the commodities shoot up in prices. So what's, that's how they earn. So technically, they profit or they're provided a relief which can no longer be sold with the financial, uh, you know, of the Federal Reserve and all this. So the war has become a provides them temporary relief uh, or or the so maybe a more substantive discussion or on, on how how the hegemon is at the collective West. What's happening to them that's causing all these wars, and what can be done even on a structural or even on a policy reform that can nip in the bud, so to speak, all these directions towards uh, escalation of, or building up towards uh, war. Okay, um, Michael. So, uh, yeah, anyway, thank that's you. all. <laughs> thank you. Is, is there anyone? I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone among our speakers would uh, like to respond to that quickly? Well, uh, uh, unless yeah, Rainer, and, perhaps and Joe oh, can, yeah. uh, uh, you know, if you want to, you can go ahead. I, I, I would respond. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I, I think <clears throat> that, um, looking at this specific instance of the Philippines, I think it's very important for us to have a really um, uh, independent diplomacy. Uh, on the one hand, uh, to, dis <clears throat> to deal with the lesser problem, which is uh, China's um, moves in the South China Sea. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, we need to deal with that. Uh, and, you know, we, we need to be forceful in telling China that uh, uh, demilitarization and, and de nuclearization is the way to go, not just unilaterally claiming that territory. Uh, but the more important problem is really the buildup of uh, the, the Philippines as a base for the containment of China, uh, which the U.S. has, uh, has done uh, with the full um, support of the Marcos administration. And um, we have um, basically an administration in the Philippines which has outsourced its defense and foreign policies to the United States, mainly because the president is afraid that if he did not follow the orders of the United States, the U.S. can easily move on the $10 billion in assets that, 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 that the Marcos family has, mainly in the West. I mean, that's blackmail diplomacy, but it's so easy to, to blackmail uh, Marcos at this point in time, and that's what the U.S. has been doing. Okay, so uh, the uh, uh, and uh, you know, so with respect to the Philippines, I think we we have this problem, and we really need to present uh, a, a, a good um, you know push for an independent foreign policy that steers between the United States and China. The only other thing is. Um, um michael's point that um basically <laughs> you know if china is where it is today it's because it was partly created by the united states um you know um the cheap labor okay um uh, and and basically until uh, trump came to power in 2017 was uh, you know, the U.S. corporate elite and the transnationals were very much, you know, uh, part of that whole um, uh, partnership with China. Uh, and um, as we all know, what has happened is it resulted in deindustrialization. Uh, and basically, you know, the Chinese were very successful in, in, in bringing industries to China. And they were very successful in technology transfer. Uh, and, you know, we had this situation whereby um, in, uh, 
coupled with the financialization of the U.S. economy, um, you know, you know, the rise of China was to a great extent at the expense of the United States. And um, the only place now where the United States has an absolute superiority over China is in the military. Uh, and that's why that's what it's using the threat of the military at this point in time to sort of uh, shore up its 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 uh, its um, uh, position. So, um, but again, this uh, this this comes right back to the question of the BRICS that uh, Anu uh, in fact mentioned that you have a whole series of new institutions that are emerging in the global south. Um, 45 countries just said that they want to join the BRICS and everybody, you know, and, and there's a lot of um, um, feeling that we really need a new international order, de-dollarization, et cetera, et cetera. And that's opening up at this point in time. That's one of the positive things that I, I, I would like to, to underline uh, at this point in time, that uh, even as we face dangers, at this point, there's always the other side of opportunities, and you know, I I think we we need to look at that too. That uh, that there are opportunities for the global south that have uh, emerged. The, the only final point I would like to make is uh, it's it's a very difficult situation in the United States for our you know you know for the American people uh, and. Um, uh, I, I, I certainly, you know, we need to work with Joe and others to to really fight the domestic implications of a fascist takeover in the United States because uh, it's very real that uh, that's you know uh, that's going to happen, uh, and um, so um, uh, I hope Joe that there's still going to be some miracle that will happen between now and November 4th. <laughs> I'm just worried that maybe the age of miracles is over when it comes to the United States. But nevertheless, <laughs> I think that the kind of support for progressive politics that we can give to forces in the United States uh, is, is extremely important at this point in time because I think the opposition to Trump really will need to come from progressives because the liberals are very tired at this point, <laughs> in my sense, yeah. and they can't provide the vision that would counter the the far right. Uh, so, uh, so Joe, you have a very important role to play. Well, Thank you, Walden. I, I think just, you know. just, yeah, just just very very quickly, Walden. Just just to really appreciate oh, okay. your your, your well, words. We, we recognize our limitations. So I just want to make two two quick uh, points in responding to Michael. Uh, first of all, uh, you know it's 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 critically important that we do all we can to build our social movements to impact and constrain governments as they press toward war. Uh, you know the power of the people is real, uh, and we have to we have to build it. Uh, the second is just to give a signal here. Um, some of the people on this call, I think each of the speakers and a few others, uh, have made really important contributions uh, to the development of a, a vision and a resource for common security diplomacy uh, in uh, across what's called the Indo-Pacific. We're actually nearing its completion. It can provide a foundation for uh, the pursuit of independent uh, foreign policies. And my expectation is that we'll be releasing it uh, early in the fall. And I just wanted to let people know that it's coming and to suggest that you keep your eyes open for it. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, well, I think, uh, uh, well, it has been, uh, <laughs> we're almost at the end. In fact, we've overshoot the time, but uh, it has been a very interesting uh, conversation that we had at this point. I'd like also to say that <laughs> we have started talking about uh, uh, part two of this uh, uh, roundtable discussion. Uh, as you observe, our title is Global NATO uh, Implications and Resistance. And um, uh, I'm sure you observe that we dealt with analysis 
at this point. And what we want to do next uh, in the part two, apart from trying to address the, the issues that came up here that seems to need more in-depth uh, discussion, would also uh, deal with uh, the resistances that are going that are happening in many parts of the world. So uh, hoping that it could basically connect movements and uh, people and uh, move towards uh, some consolidation, we hope, but uh, sharing, uh, having this opportunity as well of uh, sharing information is one of the things that the Asia Europe People's Forum as well as the International Peace Bureau would like to continue doing uh, in the coming uh, days uh, and months. So um, may I now, I, I'm supposed to ask uh, uh, for a short concluding remarks from our speakers. I see that Anu is back and uh, uh, I don't know who goes first, maybe uh, uh, Rainer? And then, and then just jump in, and then we close. Uh, and then Rafi, I'm going to ask Rafi to shorten his uh, summing up, and for him to develop uh, a, an article that would basically encapsulate all the things that we've tried to, uh, you know, uh, learn together uh, this evening. So who goes first, Rainer? Please, you're muted. Rainer, your audio. So now it will hopefully works. So first sentence, BRICS is really a part of the hope. And we can only hope that BRICS will continue developing in the, in the constitution how it is now and maybe with future partners. Second, I think the key point of everything we are dealing, how much hope we have, how much see this situation is really a dangerous situation, how when we are fighting for banning the monster, is that we need to enlarge the peace movement. This is the key player what we have to do. And I think this is our common work and our common challenges. And we have to do this in every country where we are and internationally together to develop really a movement which can stop the dangerous development, can come back, and I underline what Joseph was saying, to a policy of common security, which accepts the security interests of all sides, goes to dialogue and negotiation, and include disarmament. And this is, for me, is a sign of hope. And I think we have a huge, huge challenge to do, and I, hope for, I can only hope that we will be successful. Joseph? Uh, well, it's difficult to, to add much to, to what's been, been said. I mean, uh, just to appreciate what everyone has said, um, to appreciate Reiner kind of falling in there in terms of the need to, uh, to build our movements. I guess the one thing I would say, you know, the many people here I can't see because I, uh, your names are there, but I, I can't see you. Um, but I think one of the challenges for us uh, is to be working on gener generational transition, uh, to be uh, finding ways that we can identify uh, young people who have uh, moral compasses, uh, a sense of commitment, a willingness to take risk, uh, and to uh, provide ways in which we can both learn from them and begin working with them. Uh, because uh, without, without the engagement of young people, we're not going to make it. The only other thing to, to say is the obvious need to be uh, working across issues, uh, the, you know, the to engage those movements working. I mean, here in the United States, one of the hopeful things is the, you know, the tremendous youth outpouring uh, calling for an end to the genocide uh, in, in Gaza. I mean, it's it's been, it's a, a, we haven't seen this kind of energy in the U.S. peace movement for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of pressure coming against them. Uh, so we need to be supporting them. Uh, but we we need to find ways to make common 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 issue common work uh, with them on, on, on climate as well, 
Uh, so working to build a really broad movement you know, for human survival and sanity. Walden? Uh, yeah, any, uh, any yes. final words? Well, yeah, just to, to reiterate some of the points that I've said. Um, uh, one is it came out towards the end, the you know that the Asia Pacific, per, you know, in the South China Sea in particular, is a powder keg, uh, and um, we in the Philippines, together with our allies in the rest of the Asia Pacific, have a special responsibility to to prevent, uh, you know, the situation from getting out of hand. But it would be very important for us to realize here that even as we really need to be firm uh, with China to push it towards negotiation and demilitarization and denuclearization through negotiation, we need to be very clear, uh, and this is very important in the Philippines, that the principal problem that we face is the United States and its push to make the Philippines the launching pad for the containment of China. Uh, what the Pentagon says that the Philippines is important to support Taiwan or whatever, uh, that's completely false. Uh, you know, they're out to make the Philippines what was once described as an unsinkable aircraft carrier uh, for the containment of China. The other thing uh, is, um, what I mentioned earlier is that while there are definitely dangers, and probably this period is is as dangerous as any uh, in 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 the Cold War, we also need to look at the opportunities and the rise of actors like China, the way that they offer uh, alternatives or space for uh, other countries in the global South, not only money. Um, but also as uh, models for uh, development, um, uh, which may also be limited, but, but you know, we we need to have that negotiation. Um, uh, we need to have that dialogue uh, at this point in time. So there's opportunities that have been created and the BRICS, as Reiner says, and others have said, the BRICS are a very important um, institution to develop along these lines. So uh, crisis and opportunity go together. Uh, the third thing is the liberal international order is in crisis, very, very much in crisis at this point in time. And NATO is part of that, uh, as is the IMF and the World Bank. And uh, even as it articulates expansionist designs and moves, we also need to realize that this is an alliance uh, that belongs to the past and is in crisis and is in a very defensive state uh, at this point in time. And um, what we need to do is apart from uh, the opposition to NATO that we are building in the global south, we also need to study the political configurations in the United States, um, especially uh, between the liberals um, broadly uh, and the far right uh, in terms of their politics towards institutions like NATO. Uh, will they continue to support alliances or will they become more unilateralists uh, in terms of their approaches? These are all things that we need to study very closely as Trump uh, comes, um, uh, uh, comes closer to power. And... Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in line with that, yes, I think we need to express our support to um, progressives in the United States, um, but we also need to express it uh, in terms of um, progressives in Europe who are threatened by similar fascist forces, the AFD in Germany, and of course, Marine Le Pen in France, um, that represent also uh, very regressive tendencies when um, it comes to the ways that they would like to, to political regimes that they would like to um, to create. So um, my only point is to repeat what Gramsci said, the new world is being born and this is a time when monsters emerge. And uh, 
Unfortunately, we have to pass through that passage before we can get to the promised land. I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate to use that word, promised land, to the safe harbor. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank you, Walden. Finally, I know. Thank you. I think I've learned so much uh, from uh, all, all the uh, presentations today, but I just want to uh, say one last word of caution, and that is my concern because we are so linked to social movements and the progressives, is the fear of they them also being split. And you could see that the Ukraine war had a very negative impact on the joint peace movement while they came together on, on Palestine. Uh, but they were divided on Ukraine and they were cursing each other. Uh, similarly, today, the, the feminist movement, because NATO, its major agenda, it's again there in the document, is women, peace and security. So to co-opt, they, they say feminist women must, you know, be militarized women. Uh, they So uh, the feminist movement is very neatly split. The liberals, uh, you know, uh, and the progressives. So on all these issues, I think civil society is also facing its own challenge. And so the need for this kind of analysis, so we keep putting out these views and facts uh, is extremely important. And so I'm grateful to uh, IPB and APF for having having taken this step. Thank you. Thank you, Anu. Uh, and, and thank you, all our panelists and our participants. Rafi. Can you give us a very quick summing up? I uh, and as we look forward to the write up that you're going to prepare in the coming days, Rafi. Uh, yeah, so I I think it's pretty much impossible to try to summarize a conversation <laughs> like this. <laughs> the, the number of bases that were touched upon and the the nuanced opinions ranging from whether or not like the far right would actually support or detract. Uh, support from NATO or the involvement of the global south and their dynamics with NATO. It's all just a lot that was covered and I'm very grateful that uh, I was able to sort of like experience this debate. I think it's uh, been an educational experience for everyone. So I'll try to condense my comments into two main themes. The first one is touching on what Joseph mentioned, uh, being the importance of youth in uh, peace activism. I, I totally agree. I think it's really important more so, and this is something that I think uh, could be talked about a bit more, uh, increasing the mentorship that young people receive from past generations. Because we, we talk about like young people having a stronger uh, or, or strong moral compass and then uh, feeling passionate when it comes to certain geopol geopolitical issues. But I think there's a large crisis in trust that young people have when it comes to authority and uh, like other generations, older generations. I think that kind of crisis makes it really difficult uh, or at, like at least kind of serves as an impediment for actually having like meaningful coordinated uh, action and impact. And so I think uh, as important as it is to sort of like incorporate young people into uh, peace activism, it's also really important that we find sort of people who have experience who are willing to sort of like take young people under their wing and sort of help them uh, grow and develop and provide them the sort of tutelage that's necessary for uh, people to really uh, find a way and like what their particular niches. And uh, aside from that, I just wanted to sort of leave off with a couple of final questions that I think uh, touch upon some crucial themes that were mentioned in the debate. The first question that I would like to ask, well, not, not to the panelists exclusively, but also to the audience to kind of like uh, just like impart a couple of thoughts. The first one is, uh, can we create a third path separate from the isolation isolationists of the far right and the neoliberal gurus who have infected the left, which can impose uh, oppose NATO and advocate for a multipolar world order? The uh, second question is, uh, what can China do to be an effective challenger to NATO hegemony? The third question uh, is how should the global south try to reform the age-old institutions which have now been exposed for having western uh, pro-western biases and the last question i would like to ask uh, as sort of like a, to sort of uh, encourage further thought is uh, what should the role of peace activists be in trying to loosen the grip that nato currently has on the world so uh that that's pretty much all i have to say in, uh, in regards to the conclusion 
Um, I will be putting out an article uh, providing a bit more of an extensive summary that people could look at on their own time. Uh, but yeah, thank you uh, for, for the opportunity and, uh, for all your advice. Thank you, Rafi. And uh, that's something, uh, you know, uh, summing up that ends with three important questions. I think that is a good way to segue into the part two of this roundtable discussion. And I think that when we talk about resistance, it is always <laughs> our hope that we will see more younger people uh, being able to speak about what they're doing uh, along that line. So thank you so much, Joseph, Walden, Anu, and Rainer for this wonderful learning experience that you have you know, uh, provided us. And I hope that our friends who joined us this evening or whatever time uh, in your place um, will join us for part two, watch out for that. We will try to uh, make it happen as soon as we can, despite the very busy schedule. Uh, but, uh, you know, anything that's urgent is something that APF and IPB would gladly want to do uh, to organize around it. So thank you so much.